Branch Isolay, thank you so fucking much for coming back on the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast for the umpteenth time. How are you? <laughs> doing well, my brother. Doing well. How are you today? Oh, I'm fan-fucking-tastic. You, um, you know, are definitely winning for the person who's made the most appearances on this show. <laughs> and I don't see any signs of that changing. You're like our first standing resident guest. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's always a joy being with you. Yeah, you know, we, we get to talk freely and openly, and, and um, hopefully that, that's helpful to listeners. Yeah, you're the only person who has a heart for Christ who can, who's not offended by my, what some would call vulgarity, and who will respond to me every time I call wanting to have a conversation about Jesus. So, you know, it's meant to be. Well, yeah. it's, you know, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, I was on a podcast yesterday and we were talking about one of my books that's um, sexually oriented, you know, um, the, the stories are all um, around sexual interaction and not all sex, but foreplay and, you know, intimacy. And um, in the conversation, somebody said something about, well, how can you write about Christian subjects and then turn right around and write, you know, what we consider erotica? And my simple answer is, you know, sex is part of life. It, it's part of who we are as a species and it's part of our behavior. So, you know, if you have a problem with it, I can understand that, but you know, God made sex part of our our relationships and our life, so it's part of who we are and what we do. So um, I don't see the the transition as being a, a problem. But that you know, everybody has their opinions, and I feel the same way about you know, uh, cussing as they say or swearing. Uh, I have yet to meet some. I have people you know are offended by some of the language that they hear and they, they may use. And my point is, you know, at some point in your life, I'm sure you've said that. So, um, you know, you have to get over it or get through it. And, it, you know, it's part of life. It, it's who we are and what we do. So what can I say? I concur. God created sex. It wasn't our idea. And, you know, but if someone wants to try to, to, to to play that game with it then you know there's plenty of biblical references to people who yeah. you know look at king david he reigned on earth he's set to reign again you know you know you know at the end of the world and everything yeah. like that and he had plenty of pussy all kinds of wives and concubines and shit so he was highly sexual but this is a man who god said was a man after who is a man after his own heart and so end of story done you can totally have have a strong sexual life and be super close to god you don't have to it's not one or the other so well i guess it, it, it's a matter of you know what people consider sin and i often share with people you know in god's eyes a sin is a sin there's no difference in degrees of you know uh, immorality in action it's all a sin. And as believers in Christ, and this is a hard concept for a lot of people to get their head around, we are forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future. Even though we may sin again, sin, you know, in the human vernacular sense, we may sin again in the future. But as followers and believers in Jesus, <clears throat> we are forgiven those actions. Now, does that mean we should sin and figure it's okay because we've been forgiven as paul says of course not you know the whole reason we have a relationship with christ is so that when we are tempted to sin in our lives um you know we we think twice about it and we call on his spirit to guide us you know in our next action so it's all a, a matter of belief and trust in him that he has paid for our sins, but we are not sinning in the future simply because he has paid for our sins. You know, we, we are 
who we are. And if our heart, like David's was, is with God, then we have that communion with God and that communication with God through Christ. And he guides our steps. So, you know. It's really just that simple. And I'll quote my favorite line <laughs> from the movie uh, Girls Trip uh, with Jada Pickett and all them fabulous, delicious divas. Um, my favorite quote from there says, you really can have it all. And so it is, it is humans that have complicated this life, not the Lord. And so uh, before we get on the, uh, the topic of today, uh, Branch's website is manaopublishing.com. And that will go in the show, showy notes. He has like about a thousand books he's written, poetry and everything like that. Um, he had run his own publishing house and everything like that. He is a podcast guest extraordinaire. He's like a porn star with that shit. He's always up on somebody's podcast. And I absolutely love it. I met him through podmatch.com, which is a phenomenal website. God bless Alex San Filippo for sending that gift to the world through him. It's a beautiful thing when I, when I see it being done just right, like the way he's doing it. That is his purpose, at least one of his major purposes. And I think nobody would disagree with me on that. And so, again, stuff about Podmatch will also be in the showy notes, too. Now, speaking of the complications that humans give to things, today, Branch and I are going to be focusing on communion. Easter is upon us, and I felt inspired to enlighten the world about communion some call it the eucharist we got all these different names for the same things but it's the little cracker you see people eat and some grape juice or some wine i got my set back here i got me some fucking cabernet in mine a good cabernet sauvignon baby and my unleavened bread um the lord um drank his wine and his first miracle was turning water into real wine i'm not about to have grape juice but I'm doing something to commemorate the creator of the entire universe. So we're going to have the real thing. And so I wanted to do this show <laughs> because I want to show, I want to show people how to do communion because you can totally do this at home. You don't have to go traipsing to somebody's church to do anything that connects you to Jesus Christ. You do not have to have a church and you don't have to have a preacher. So I wanted to talk first about why people go to church, why people get into it. And the scripture that I found was Hebrews 10 and 25. This is the scripture they always told me growing up. And it says to forsake not the gathering together of yourselves. And, and they use this scripture to say, you see there, here it is in Hebrews. You got to always come to church. And if you don't, you're forsaking the gathering together of people and you're breaking the, the rules and you're sinning if you don't come to church. So... What are your thoughts on that branch? Like historically, like what was going on, do you think that, you know, culturally during that time that would make them write such a thing? Well, of course, you know, after, after the death of Christ, when the first Christians, um, which, who were actually Jews, got together to celebrate what he had taught them and what they had learned, um, they met in what we would call a home church or home environment. You know, they met in small groups and they shared what they knew and what they had learned and what they had experienced when Jesus walked among them. And out of that came, you know, this uh, communion or Eucharist um, rite of passage almost from um, expressing your devotion and your commitment to Christ. So, you know, the church grew out of those small gatherings of, of believers in that first century. And by the second and third century, you know, Christianity had spread throughout the Roman Empire and the gatherings became bigger and a little more formal and leadership took place. So once you get that kind of a structure, you know, you need a bigger place. And then they started building churches and it became a religion as an outgrowth of that sharing knowledge of Jesus Christ in our lives, in our daily lives. So um, just like every other religion, 
which grew from a seedling of a master of scripture. Um, they grow into behemoths where the faith part and the closeness to the master often gets diluted with the politics of the church. Um, that's who we are as people. That's our, that's our human nature is to try and gain control of it, you know, so that we're in control. And then we, once we have control, we have the power to wield over other people, in that case, you know, in a church situation, over the congregation. So, but, you know, you don't have to go to church or show up in a building to have that relationship with Christ, just that you, you know, have just pointed out. It's a, it's a personal, spiritual relationship. It's personal before it is anything else. And like what I did before when I had made mistakes about my understanding of God, when I got kicked out of Lakewood Church and I let that cause a division in between me and God, you see, I was putting the preachers and the pastors and the worship leaders in the church on a pedestal and making an idol out of them. And I didn't realize that I was. How do I know that? Because when I got kicked out, I got angry at God and I stopped talking. I stopped going to all the churches and I stopped praying and I stopped doing everything because I had conflated and put God on the same level as Joel Osteen and Victoria Osteen and, and, and all the worship leaders and, and the church itself and the service I was doing for the church. What should have happened is, well, as soon as I saw that they didn't want gay people serving with the children, I should have just left the whole church to begin with for them being specifically exclusionary towards a certain group of people. But, um, but since I didn't do that, if they were going to kick me out for some reason, I should have just said, fuck them, but not fuck the God. Like I shouldn't, I should have just went to a church that accepted gay people and kept my relationship with God. But I let what, how people treated me tear my whole religious construct down. So it was torn down. It was able to be torn down because it was built on a weak foundation to begin with in terms of my understanding of it. So I'm doing much of what I do to prevent people from unknowingly falling into that same trap of giving these preachers in these churches too much damn credit. You know, you don't, they just don't, they don't deserve to have all that and they're not all that and they're gonna be wrong about shit. They already are. And so when the scandals come out and we have our Jerry Falwells fucking the pool boys and fucking everybody who's not his wife, you know, there's no need for us to be shocked you know, this is these, these preachers are people. They doing everything everybody else is doing. And we don't know what the hell they're not doing when they're not around us. The, the image they present at church is just one side of them. It doesn't matter who they are. They still got their own habits and things like that. So it's time for us to get to know God for ourselves. Because when shit gets worse than this earth, we can't be needing to go run to a preacher to get a prayer through. We can't wait till we get to church to find God. We can't go find a priest to confess to to get forgiveness when Christ has already handled that job. You know, I'm trying to bring people face to face with God like he wants to be. As he said, as near as the air we breathe, not as near, I'm near, but you got to go through somebody to get to me. <laughs> you know, that's not what he said. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, we, we, live in a, we live in a physical world and we grow up in a physical world. And that's all we know, basically. I mean, you know, one of the big concepts that are hard to understand is worshiping and having a relationship with something unseen, right? And that's what faith is all about, is having that relationship with the unseen supremacy of God. And we, our world, by its very nature, tries to separate us from God and put him so far away from us that it's necessary for us to go through some ecumenical person, a priest, a pastor, a pope, um, in order to you know, reestablish that relationship with God. And because that's the nature we grow up in, that's what we believe to be the only truth. He said it best a moment ago when you said your understanding. When we understand that God as our creator is within us 
and with us all the time, if we choose to acknowledge his presence, then we know that we can have that personal relationship with or without a church setting, you know, or a gathering of fellowship believers. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with being a believer and attending church as long as, you know, you're grounded spiritually in that relationship with God through Christ. Christ is our ecclesiastic mediator. He's the one that we go through to get to God, not necessarily the priest or the pastor or the pope. So, right. You're so, right on, my brother. So what you're, you're right saying, on. You're what you, hallelujah, on a Friday morning. Um, so what you're saying is what I would agree with. So people got to got to got to start in this physical realm somewhere because that's what we see. And then as they mature, then they can get to a point of what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Jesus said, you know, when we're babies, we get milk. And as we mature into adults, then we can handle the meat. So the exposure is the milk, the relationship and the growth, you know, with Christ is the meat. Right. And so what for me, what maturity in God looks like is going to church if I feel drawn to, not because I feel like I have to. Um, in my personal time with him alone, I feel like I learn more than I can from any preacher. So yeah, sure. that's what it sure. looks like. Yeah, that, well, that's that's what communion is truly all about, is that connection, that talking with God, you know in our minds, with our mouth, that connection that we have um, every day. It doesn't have to be one hour on a Sunday or a Saturday or a Wednesday night. It can be every time you think of him, the Holy Spirit, God the Father and God the Son, or any one of the three, they are responding every time we're making that connection. And the, the further you go down the spiritual path, and the more they are part of your thought process, the more you'll see his spiritual power working in your life. Yep. Because what you want is, so like when, when we die, we don't want to be in a position where we're standing at God and, it's, and we feel like we're talking to a stranger. We got to be facilitating that relationship now. So when we actually see his face it's as though we've had a long distance relationship with someone who we're finally getting to meet but we're totally familiar with so this means i need you to push your social media away and spend a little bit more time you know with god praying fast if you want to reading your bible doing the things that you can looking up different scriptures different ways to look at it online different commentaries you know different things and then get serious because this walk with god is kind of like we're dating him when we date people, we get to know them. We experience them in different environments, different settings and things like that. So I want people to, to really get intimate with God, you know, and you're at your best with that when there's no one around and it's just you and him, period. And so, so we're talking about communion. Why am I talking about communion? Because communion is a beautiful thing. We first see this act of communion in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, John, all them, when Jesus is getting ready to get crucified. He calls all of his disciples together, and um, he has, uh, you know, communion, and he tells them, he gives them the wine, the unleavened bread, the bread represents his body, which is about to be broken, and then the blood represents his blood, which is about to be shed. I believe in communion when I was young and I was a nosy ass kid poking my nose in places where I believed it should be going. And so no matter who said where it shouldn't be going, damn it, I needed to know shit. And so the preachers in those days would go around to see the older people who didn't go to church and bring the communion to them. And communion consists of grape juice or actual fermented wine. Like I said, I got my Cabernet and my wine, my communion cup back here. And then unleavened bread, because that was an Israelite thing, especially during like Passover and stuff like that. They didn't fool with the leaving. And that's a whole other topic there. But um, cause you know, it's a pure purification thing. So the bread didn't have any leaving in it. 
So I, so the preacher comes and minister his. Now this, now we're at her house. We're not in church. And he asked me, and I followed him into my grandmother's house. And he asked me if I wanted to commune. I was like, sure. And I must have been like five, you know, <laughs> or six, just, just a nosy fucking kid running around. And um, so I took the bread, gobbled it on down. And then when I took that grape juice from the cup or whatever, I drank it and then immediately, immediately I um I felt like a, I guess you could best describe it as kind of like an electric chill move through my body from like the waist down, not the top of my body, just the waist down. And it was so much so that I like my, my legs buckled and they gave out and I like leaned up against my grandmother's bed, which, you know, granny's bed is like a thousand feet tall. So it can certainly support any kind of <laughs> body weight. For a few days after that, it's like my body was quickened and I was moving faster than I'd ever moved before, just like in a regular walking stride. I had a new burst of energy in life. This is the sort of thing that happens when like God or an angel, you come in contact with one of them. You get, you get enlivened. And um, I don't know what it did. I didn't know that I needed the touch, but I know when I drank that grape juice out of that cup that that preacher had prayed over, something happened to me. And so I know the power is real. Um, and I want to bring this power to everybody. And I'm not saying every time you drink the cup, you're gonna catch the Holy Ghost, you're gonna feel tingling. But see, sometimes we don't feel anything at all and God is moving a whole, whole lot. So we don't judge whether or not God is doing anything about what we can necessarily see and feel. That's what faith is all about, believing whether or not we can't see it. So I don't know, Branch, have you ever had, had or witnessed any sort of personal experiences happening around communion? Not, not that I can recall that was that kind of a awakening. But what you described, two things. Number one, when we have a relationship with Christ, we have a relationship with God the Father through his spirit in Christ, as Christ is in us, you'll find your connection to the Trinity is heightened and you will notice his presence in your life. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's audible or audio, and sometimes it's just a sense you have that he's there guiding your steps. The, the great thing about his presence is if you recognize it, you will discover later on at some point, could be quick time or it could be you know days or weeks later his presence will show up in your life where you will definitely recognize something happening um it's just the way it works and it, you know it's hard for non-believers or those who are struggling with that relationship to, to grasp it, it's like i said the other day in a show the further you go down that path with christ the more you'll see him working in your life. And once you start seeing it and recognizing it, you'll see it more and more often. It will become almost second nature so that every time in your daily life, you think about the Trinity, Father, Son, and or Spirit, there'll be a recognition for you that they are recognizing that connection with them. It's just, it's all the Spirit thing. And I think you and I talked about you know, the principalities of light and dark and spirit and the world before. And that's what happens. The, the greater your spiritual growth takes place with Christ, the more often you see him working and being in your life. And it just becomes second nature. And you automatically turn to him at every juncture when you're, you know, struggling or under stress and he responds. And, and it's just, it's the nature of, you know, his unconditional love and his compassion for each of us as believers in him as the son of God. Yeah, so just give it time. This is a, yeah. a thing of patience. You can't run out and become spiritually mature overnight. You can't rush any relationship. It takes time. Yep. So... So the Eucharist deals with the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, I've heard some people say before that the, the concept of the blood of Jesus just sounds disgusting to them. They're like, who wants to be covered in blood? That just sounds like a horror movie. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so, because that's in your know, people in churches, you'll hear them say, you know, I plead the blood of Jesus or I'm covered in the blood of the lamb, you know, or something like that. You care to explain to us what does it mean to plead the blood of Jesus or to be covered in the blood of the lamb? How does that transfer, translate from Jesus's physical blood spilling to the, to the spiritual way it's meant today? Wow, there's about three different things in what you just said. First of all, it's symbolism, right? The bread is a symbol of his body. The, the wine is a symbol of his blood, as you said. Our, the, the body was broken and the blood was shed. To be covered in the blood of Christ is to take on his righteousness, you know, as the, as the sacrifice for our sins. And then when we die, we will be uh, refined by his spiritual power that was, you know, when he, when he shed his blood for us, he became the living son of God for us. So, you know, the, it's just like the, the cross that people wear, you know, around their neck or somewhere on their body as a symbol of their, their Christian identity. It's a symbol. And, and people who, you know, sort of get caught up in the drinking of the blood and, and that kind of a concept just are missing the whole point. And, you know, you just can't, some people just refuse to want to understand or have clarity and uh, they're not at that place yet that's all that they're not ready you know to make that leap of faith and understand who christ was <clears throat> why he came the first time and why he's coming back again so it's it's all symbolism you have to look past the the actual wine and see what it represents Right. So then if I say, I plead the blood of Jesus, our Lord, cover me with your blood. What I'm saying is, God, I, I understand the sacrifice you made for me. And I believe that that power is still alive today. I'd like to cash in on that. You know, I'm not, I'm not, exactly. I'm not saying dump a bucket of blood on me. I just, I would like to cash in on, on the work that you did, spiritually speaking. So, so here we have Jesus before he was about to be betrayed. We know Judas Iscariot was the ultimate criminal informant in history, although Jesus wasn't a criminal. I had an informant who snitched me out to the cops before SWAT came and kicked my door in. So I can understand, you know, Jesus feeling betrayed. You know, it's bad when you got somebody who's been running with you, close to you, who also don't like you, who plotting against you, which is what Judas was about. So that's where the term when people say, oh, he's a Judas or something like that. <laughs> You know, we're talking about the ultimate snitch. And um, so Jesus turned to him and he said, that what you do, do quickly. Go on and sell me out for the 30 pieces of silver. It's already arranged. Go, go secure the bag so we can get on with this crucifixion thing. And then Branch and I will be talking about the crucifixion next week. And uh, we're going to go into detail about what this whole thorny crown and why, what, what does a man carrying a cross and dying on a cross have to do with me today? You know, we're going to talk about the crucifixion next week. And um, so here we are, Jesus, what, he's already washed his disciples' feet and they're sitting down to have this, what we call the last supper. When you hear somebody say the last supper, this is the last time Jesus is having communion or communing, hanging out with his disciples before he's to go to, to get crucified. So this is where the concept comes from. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where the apostle Paul kind of lays it out. And he starts it saying, for I have received of the Lord. So it seems to me like maybe this came to him in a vision or something like that, where he learned about the act of communion from God, from Jesus himself. And this was a scripture that they always <laughs> preached every time we had communion in Sunday in the Pentecostal church, every time we did it, they always did 1 Corinthians 11. So anything you'd like to say at this point, Branch? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. It, it can all be. It can also be found in Luke twenty-two. Um, you know, with the actual disciples at the supper. But okay. Same con Same scripture. 
Right. And so, um, and so basically they, they, they just, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of things that are said that don't really directly have to do with the bread and the wine, but are still important all the same. So I'm just going to focus on the bread and the wine because that's what we're here for today. And so the body represents the, the physical sacrifice. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then it says, after the same manner, also he took the cup saying, this is my blood, drink it, you know, as often as you do this and remember me. So the, the way he's phrasing this as often as you do it means it's something that can be done again and again and again. And this wasn't um, a one-time uh, thing that he shared with his disciples. He said this to do in remembrance of me. So Jesus wants us to, to have a physical way to remember his sacrifices. You know, when we do things physically, it reinforces it in our conscious and in our subconscious minds in our spirit and it makes his sacrifice a reality today in the present even though it was done many years ago so he wants us to sit down and celebrate it i kind of get the feeling of how we do our birthdays or an anniversary or something like that you know we want to always commemorate it and find a way to keep it alive and fresh and so that to me is kind of like the breakdown of how communion came about to be Jesus gave the first example, and then we picked it up from there. Well, a lot of people, you know, anyone who prays before a meal and, and thanks the Lord for what they're about to receive, that's the same outward expression of what he was talking about. You know, at, at that Last Supper, he was trying to describe to the disciples, these are people, these are men who had been with him, you know, up to three years and had walked with him and learned from him every day. And, and still many of them misunderstood what was happening. And so he tries to describe the suffering he's about to go through on the cross and why he's going to do it, you know, for his day and for ours. And so what he's asking them to do is every time, you know, you're sitting down to eat or drink in a supper situation, just like we do at supper or dinner, he's giving us that opportunity to reconnect with him through what we're taking in, what we're consuming in our body. If we're remembering him by prayer before we do that, then we're recognizing that reestablishment of our spiritual consumption of him with us today. And so it's, it's that transfer of the physical to the spiritual, both in his day and for us. And so we, you can do it, like Devan had said, you can do it at home whenever, but you can do it every time you sit down for a meal. You can remember, you know, the Lord by what you're taking in and you're reestablishing that spiritual reconnection and taking him back in. So go and ahead, I've, my brother. Here. And I've heard it. <laughs> That's a very good breakdown, my man. You know, and I've heard it said, you know, when you drink that, that grape juice or that wine, you know, you're drinking actual physical healing to yourself. You know, your faith can take you as far as you're willing to go with it. And so, you know, I've heard it said, you know, you know, when you eat, you eat the, eat the bread that represents his body and you're taking that life into yourself, you know, so that concept there bends around, using the act of communion to try to heal physical infirmities. I'm not going to take that away and say that it's impossible, especially not after that touch that I got one, you know, that day when I was a kid, you know, you know, this is, this is, this is a, this is a powerful tool that God has really given us. And so, and it says as often as you do it, if you want to do communion every week, every day, you know, that's in between you and God, however, you know, it's the one other way we have to feel close to him. But my point in doing this today is we approach Easter to let you know that you do not have to wait till you go to church to experience this communion with God. And so at this point, here, I'm going to show you how I do it. And um, I'm just going to reach back here 
and get this little piece of unleavened bread. It took me a while to track this down on the internet. It's, you know, it's, it's really yeasty, you know, in this country, <laughs> but I finally found, you know, <laughs> me some unleavened bread or maybe I went to Whole Foods. I think I went to Whole Foods and actually was able to get this. And so you can read the scripture in Corinthians or a different one if you want to or not. So when, when I do it, I try not to be so super formal about stuff because I don't want to lose the meaning in ritual and informality. You know, I like it to be real, like I'm just having a conversation. I mean, you know, with my boyfriend, I don't have a script that I use to talk to him. Uh, you know, I just don't, I just flow. And then and that's the same way I try to be with God because it's real. Because God ju judges the hearts and the reins. He does not judge the outward actions like that. He's looking into the real reasons why you're doing what you're doing. So it's not really, which no man is qualified to do. So, and so it's really about the heart of the matter. So whenever I'm ready to feel a little bit close to the Lord, I will get me some unleavened bread like this sucker right here. And maybe I'll say a prayer like, Lord, I'm about to take this communion with you. I appreciate the sacrifice that you gave for all of us all those years ago. Though that sacrifice is still just as alive today as you are. And I know that as I take this communion that I am lining up and sinking into and tapping into and becoming one with eternity and, within you, and with you and with all that you are, all that has been, is, and what will be. I ask you to take me with you on into your strength and on into your grace. And as I take this bread and as I drink this wine, I want to thank you for what you've done. I want to thank you for what you are doing. And I appreciate what you're going to do. Heal me and cleanse me and make me right and make me whole by your standards and nobody else's in Jesus' name. Now, some people like to break the bread and do it. It doesn't matter to me because it's going to be broken once you start crunching on it. So whatever suits your fancy. <laughs> oh. Now I have my cup. You can get communion sets off the internet. They were like really expensive and you had to get like a whole lot of them. And they had like a short expiration date. And so you can get you like some Welch's grape juice, honey, or a bottle of wine, like this Cabernet I have right here, and you'll be in a better position. And then you just drink it. And that's all there is to it. And now I believe the Lord heard that. It's a simple thing, but a little bit goes a long way with Christ. Like I said, he judges the hearts in the reins, the motives behind things, just because we sit down and take the time to do something special for and with God, he can't help but honor that because we take time to do so much, everything else that brings us pleasure in life. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but how much do we travel, fuck, drink alcohol, go out, have fun, party, go to museums, social media, for God's sakes, you know, we play our video games. How much time do we spend doing all the fuck we want to do? But if we were to take a snapshot of our time spent in a week or a month, how much time do we actually personally spend with God versus all the other stuff that he's empowered us to go out and do? You know, I really want to put him first, you know, with balance. You know, I don't overdo it. I don't underdo it. But if I'm going to be having all of my amenities and things in life I'm, I'm i'm for damn sure well i'm gonna sit down and take the time to get close to the one who's who's enabling me to do it all but you got to say about it <laughs> well you have to think of communion as you just described communion communicating with god so at any time that we physically express that either you know the way you just did with the bread and wine or in prayer, or in petition, or in our behavior, how we respond. You know, what did God say um, in Matthew? Love God first and most, and love your neighbor as yourself. So when we respond to the events and the people in our lives with compassion and understanding and love, 
you know, we are communicating, we are communing, communing with God because we are responding the way Christ responded when he walked this earth and the way God would have us respond in our daily life. So it's about communion. It's about communicating. It's about having that relationship where God's spirit is active within us. It's part of us. So it's enabling us to have that communion and that communication where the where we can then in our actions express that we emulate God. We do what Jesus would have done in the same situation. And in that emulation of Jesus by thought, word, and deed, we further become children of God. And everything we do then is an act of obedience because that's what we wish to do. We wish to emulate or use Christ as our example. Um, there's, there's lots of ways to have that communion, uh, physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally. But you've got to have that living spirit within you so you've got that connection. And what do you think about, because in Corinthians it says that, um, to not take the uh, the body and blood of the Lord unworthily. For if you do so, you bring condemnation on yourself. And for this many, for this reason, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So in the church, when I was growing up, they they would use that part of the scripture to basically be like. If you come up here and take this communion unworthily without repenting for your sins first, then you could get sick or die. Or some sort of condemnation would come upon you. I wonder, do you agree with that sentiment? Um, not at all, not really. <laughs> it, it, re it reflects to me, you know, that power that the priest or the pastor is trying to use over the people in the pews you know one of the things about a relationship with god is <clears throat> the power is the spiritual power again i can't say this enough when you've got the spirit of god living within you the one thing that you will recognize in your life is truth and once you start living with truth in your life you see the fallacy and the fakeness and the falsehoods of the world. You know, and this is not to condemn the priesthood, but again, man has manipulated religion, no matter what religion it, it has been. Islam, you know, Christianity, uh, Judaism, Buddhism. The original master had insight from God and had writings which glorified God through our human nature. And <clears throat> once those masters passed away, then other people in the church or the synagogue, you know, took control. And if you are not in that same spiritual place with the master, then it's very easy to get sucked into the politics and the hypocrisy of religion. Again, no matter what religion it is. And the deeper and the more power that the church or the, the religion gathers and garners, the more it tries to impose on its membership the fact that, you know, God is up here and we're down here. And the way you get to God is through us. Just like we're trying to express today, the way you get to God is through Christ. So it's, you know, it's power and manipulation of, of men over other men or, you know, clergy over the congregation. They can say and, you know, trick people into believing just about anything because they have convinced people that they are God's representative here on earth to that group. Um, you know, you have to break free of that. Um, again, there's nothing wrong with going to church or going to synagogue, as long as when you're there, 
you're being fed the word and your heart, you know, you, you'll know in your heart whether it's bullshit that they're trying to put out and control you with or whether it's really what God would have you do and respond to. Mike, you often say the church, you know, has an agenda. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, their agenda is to get more money out of you. <laughs> um, that, you know, why any church needs to collect funds is beyond me. Um, if, if, if their congregation is being fed the truth and being fed a relationship with God through their master, or Christ, or Imam, um, Muhammad, whoever it may be, there's no reason that they that the congregation won't voluntarily tithe. You know, you don't have to browbeat them into collecting money. But here again, religions are a, a human entity with an agenda, and that agenda has to be funded. So, um, you know, the Catholic Church is one of the richest entities in the world. And yet they still collect tithes and dues. Oh, God, the Catholics. Yeah, well. <laughs> I've been watching on um, HBO plus the young Pope with Jude Law's sexy ass uh, as the uh, young Pope. And <laughs> I have to say that, that, that series is quite titillating, <laughs> quite titillating. It, and um, I actually want, there's a friend of mine who's, whose family was greatly damaged by the Catholic Church, and I really, really want to have her on my show to talk about it, because I'm just going to say this about the Catholics, you know, do what you do. I'm not here to judge nobody, but personally, there's no way that I would kiss the Pope's ring. I'm not about to um, or do any of the doctrines and stuff that they do, and the whole confessional and everything. I just don't understand where all the rules and stuff came from that they follow. It's almost like they have their own Bible or something. I'm like, who the hell came up with this shit? In um, in that way, the people wait and hang on the uh, on every word the Pope says. You know, they can't decide for themselves if this is right or wrong until he says it. And then you have the one Pope who may rule one way on something, and then another Pope who rules a different way on something but then they're both supposed to be the ultimate voice of God. Okay, well then there's some human error in here some fucking where, because otherwise one Pope shouldn't have a different opinion than the next. So they're supposed to be like the holiest guy or whatever the fuck he's supposed to be. I don't like the theatrics of the Catholic church, the big robes, the big ass hat that dude wears, the st all, all the extra shit. I'm all like, what happened to just Jesus? Like, what is all of this? And so, <laughs> So many of my friends are ex-Catholics, man, and they ain't never stepping foot in the church again. They don't give a fuck. They are done. Whatever the hell happened to them in that, in, in that Catholic religion has scarred them, and they are over it. They're over all of it. They're not having any of it. Although one said, you know, she's, she's cool with God, but just fuck the Catholic church forever. So then, you know, some of them haven't lost it all, but I don't know. People like they have they, they have like a PTSD when they leave the Catholic Church. Some sort of something ain't right in there. You shouldn't have that many people saying the same thing. Like they just felt abused, be it the poor altar boy is actually getting fucked by the by the priest, or actually like mental abuse. Like that much hurt shouldn't come from a church. I don't care how much money they have. Well, we live in a world where you know everyone has suffered some form of abuse um, you just have to realize that that's the way of nature and that's human nature and it's been going on since the beginning of mankind you know no one grows up totally absent of a dysfunctional family um, by our very nature we are dysfunctional and the the groups that we join, be they religious or social or civic, um, they all have dysfunction within them. By our human nature, we are aggressive and selfish. And when you exhibit or have those kind of desires, uh, 
you know, what's in it for me, or it's all about me. When we live our lives that way, we are going to cause harm to other people. And, you know, that's what happens when you have societies that are absent of spiritual grounding. And when you have people who, who have been sort of sucked into the world's ways, believing that, you know, this is the only way you can live. And for that reason, that's the way I'm going to live, you know, because they are absent of spiritual grounding, they're unaware that, you know, what is happening is not healthy. It's not healthy mentally, it's not healthy physically. So it's not just the church situation or the church community that has issues. Um, every community has issues and every group has issues. It's a matter of how they play out. And of course, you know, because religions rely on this power from God as God's representatives to those particular groups, they can use that power um, to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm. But that's not just indicative of religions. That's the world we live in. That's why spiritual grounding is so important. Hmm. So I would say, everybody, when we're dealing with churches and preachers and priests or whatever, rabbi, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, is to look at them through a filter. You know, like they could be right, they could be wrong. They might be a righteous person, they might not be a righteous person. What they say could be accurate, what they say could be inaccurate. You got to try try the tree for the fruit it bears, try these spirits. Jesus said there would be many spirits. And basically he's saying, don't believe everybody, you know, fill it out, research, do your own homework. So we got to stop approaching preachers and churches like they're automatically right, or like they're automatically correct. You got to deal with them like we would anybody else. Like, okay, let me see if what you're saying makes sense. You know, like that, as opposed to, okay, they're right, I'm wrong. So I'm just going to twist my thinking to, to be in line with whatever comes out of their mouth. That's not going to work. Well, here again, the key is spiritual grounding. If you have the spirit of God living in you through belief in Jesus Christ, then you will see the fallacy and the truth that they speak of. You'll recognize this is the problem with you know, people who are in churches who don't have spiritual grounding. They believe what they're being told. Um, <clears throat> just like we have today, many people believe what they're being told by politicians <laughs> and by corporations. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're filled with lies because they have an agenda of self-enrichment. -en and when you don't know what the truth looks like, you can believe anything. And with today's technology, you know, they can make anything look true to your eye. Um, you can't tell what's real and what's not real anymore because technology has so far advanced. And so you have to have you have to have the truth living within you, so you can recognize the truth or the falsehoods that are being presented to you by the world and by the people in the world and the events in the world. How do you get that spiritual? relationship how do you get god's spirit living within you so you can see the truth you go to matthew 7 you ask you seek you knock you ask jesus christ to come into your life and what he tells us in john 14 and 26 is when you ask me i will send my spirit to be with you to live with you and to guide you and that's all you have to do and once you've done that his spirit, the spirit of God as creator, will come, his Holy Spirit will come through Jesus Christ and live within you. And from that moment on, you will begin to see and recognize the truth at church, at synagogue, at temple, um, in your life, in your relationships, in your world. And you'll recognize the truth and you'll know what's true and what's not true. And then you have the choice to live by either that truth or the falsehoods of the world. And that's how easy it is to change your life. 
And truth is something we must discover for ourselves. Um, like I like say, I don't argue with people on social media over like politics and stuff like that. I did for like a hot second when I first became political back when all the Trumpy foolishness was happening. And then I quickly realized like, okay, nobody's changing here. And then I also realized- exactly. that and I also realized everything everyone was saying was a third party account. So they're either listening to Fox News or MSNBC. And I told them, I think the last thing I posted in regard to politics was this, like, none of us have verified any of this information for ourselves. You're choosing to believe a media outlet, but you weren't there. You didn't go get the report. You weren't on the ground. You didn't have boots on the ground. This is not your information. This is somebody else's information. So why sit here and argue with you about what Joe Scarborough told, what I heard Joe Scarborough say, and you're trying to tell me what Tucker Carlson said. Well, bitch, neither one of us went there to go and actually get the shit. Neither did Joe Scarborough or Tucker Carlson. So, and I saw this manifested with somebody who was new to Christianity. When I first met him, he was like agnostic or some shit. He just didn't believe in anything. Somewhere along the way, he got converted and he decided to become Christian. And so I asked him where his, what his stance was on LGBTQIA plus issues as I tend to do with people who I might be seeing from time to time because I don't fuck with people who have a problem with my uh with my sexuality, I refuse to do it because I'm not gonna let myself be abused that way again. So he gave me the textbook answer of, um, well, you know, it's not me who has a problem with it. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And then I told him before I dismissed him and I never talked to him again, um, not because we're different, but because when people have these adverse thinkings about my community, I don't know if they're going to do something to hurt me one day. And so that's why I don't want people like that close to me, not because we disagree, but because the way they disagree can be violent at times towards me. And so, um, so I told them, well, that Bible that you're reading is an American, it's from the Middle East, and it was not a written in English, you know, it was written in ancient languages, which I can already tell you haven't bothered to read. Because first of all, you just started walking with Christ like yesterday, and you ain't been. And so I encouraged him that as he's going through the Bible, to remind himself of the fact that this is someone else's account, and you are not an expert on what somebody else said. You can't be because you didn't say it. I mean, you didn't. You didn't research it. It's not your fucking shit. And then, I, and, and then I encouraged and I told him that, so what you're doing is trying to tell me my life is wrong based on someone else's interpretation of someone else's book. And I refused to accept that from him. He could not argue with his logic <laughs> because, it's, because it's simply the truth. And so I caution people to, to understand why they believe what they believe. You know, if you believe this about this group of people or you believe whatever's right or wrong, why? If you believe something about politics, why? Is it truly because you've done the hard work to determine the fact, to do your own fact finding and fact checking, or are you just listening to what someone else said, or are you just reading what someone else wrote with the right convincing words and the right tones of voice, many people can be manipulated. So your, you know, many media outlets will use your emotions to manipulate you as will preachers. So we gotta be careful about why we believe what we believe. And most people I challenge brand about why they believe what they believe cannot respond to me because the reason they believe it is because someone else said it. <laughs> so, and, so. Well, we generally believe what we grow up with, you know, and what we as children are taught and indoctrinated. What, what our family believes is our first fundamental belief because that's all we know. And so each one of us grows up believing what we've been told and what we've been exposed to. And, you know, for a great number of people, that's as far as it goes. They have no desire or no inclination to step outside of that box and have a broader view of the world. You know, this is why I always encourage people, take the blinders off and see the world for what it is, good, bad, and ugly. 
And there's a lot of people, you know, who, especially in our country, who refuse to get out of that box and, and they dig their heels in as to their beliefs and in their hearts and minds for them, you know, that is truth. And we live in a world where there's lots of agencies and corporations who are willing to um, help you continue in those beliefs. That's why we have the world we have. Um, it's not the world that we will experience after this world for believing Christians, but it's the world that we live in now. And that's why it's so important to recognize truth from fallacy and fiction and fabrications. Um, <clears throat> I can't express it enough. You know, the way you get to that place is to have the spirit of Christ living and growing within you then you will see the truth and you'll have the option and the choice and the decision as to how you're going to live your life you know with the truth and with christ in your life guiding your steps or battling the world with the world's ways you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free amen so I also wanted to say, so for anybody who might get hung up on, how we were talking about how some people use the scripture to say, if you take communion, you'll be judged and condemned. If it's really bothering you, or if you want to just be sure you have a clear conscience, all you merely need to do is just ask the Lord to forgive you of all your sins right before you take it, um, which we should be asking for forgiveness of our sins every day anyway. But, um, but you can just be like, Lord, forgive me of my sins, anything I may have done wrong, You've seen it all. I confess it. I'm not going to hide anything. I'm not running from you. Please forgive me. And I accept that forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And in that moment, you're done. Everything's clear. So you can go ahead and take your communion just in case those scriptures put any kind of fear or trepidation in you. And so, um, well, for the, you know, for your listeners who are listening to this and have wondered or are now are a little more better versed in what communion is they can start to do it if they choose to and know the reasons that it took place and what it represents and how it can connect them to the Lord, how they can commune with the Lord. So I think it's been good, you know, for people who've wondered or didn't know, now they understand a little bit better and they can make it part of their lives if they so choose to, but at least they'll know a little bit more than they might have before. So good job. Good job to you too, sir. And so that's it. That's all I wanted to say I wanted to do. And for us, this is a quick video. We've been talking for an hour, but <laughs> we usually go for like two hours. So this is probably like our shortest, <laughs> shortest interview to date. <laughs> so uh, with that, you can go ahead and have our closing word. If there's anything you'd like to say, go ahead and say it, man. I want to thank all the listeners who keep tuning in to Devanian's um, podcast. You know, podcasting is a great opportunity for people to learn a lot of different information from a lot of different people. Um, it's sort of the last bastion of free speech. And because it is free, there's podcasts out there on virtually any interest area or any subject matter that you might want or need in your life. Um, we're glad you're here with Devannon and myself. We talk about, you know, Jesus Christ and spiritual growth, and we'd love for you to come back as often as you want. Hallelujah, tabernacle and praise. Amen.